Hello and welcome to the seventh lecture uh, which I am delivering to you, uh, Elnur Musayev from the Criminal Law and Criminology Department of Baku State University in this uh, spring 2020 semester <clears throat> from Baku, Azerbaijan. This is um, a lecture part of the module uh, entitled Fight Against Corruption which I am teaching at postgraduate course. Um, lecture is about incrimination of corruption in public sector of Azerbaijan. So let's get started. Uh, I am delivering this lecture at the time of uh, this um, curfew which was um, announced due to this pandemic of disease and as usual as in our previous lectures I told to you my slogans for the time uh, which are in the colors of our national flag and it although it's in the colors of our national flag it applies equally to everyone who listens to this lecture and I thank you for your time and I hope this will inspire you along the lines of my slogans stay at home be optimistic and don't waste your time i hope that listening to my lecture will not be a waste of your time um i took into account the feedbacks and comments from uh, from listeners uh, my students mainly and well as well as some other people who uh listened to my previous lectures and after the previous almost one and a half hour long lecture, I was advised to cut it shorter. Okay, so I'm changing the format and the length of my lectures will be, um, uh, somehow they will be not as long as they used to be, just for the sake of facilitating your comprehension. Okay. Um, the content is as usual. Uh, I will set the general context for you. Okay, we will revise the, the our previous lectures. Uh, by revising, uh, we will look into some common elements, elements that are used in order to build this description of corruption offenses. And then we will go to specific offenses described in international instruments as well as in our national legislation. I will collate these uh, provisions and requirements in order to explain to you how they are implemented at a domestic level. And what you will see that um, these uh, offenses, uh, which uh, I'm going to describe to you, they are somewhat uh, compatible about uh, some of the elements and sometimes they look rather similar, so I will try to guide you so that you uh, learn to discern, uh, so you pay attention to necessary elements in distincting these offenses from each other, okay? That will be the content of our lecture, and I'm targeting about, um, uh, it will be certainly below one hour, but I will try to make it shorter. So, synopsis of our previous lectures, especially the part uh, um, on the incrimination of corruption. Well, as I told you, Azerbaijan took um, the model of the set by the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. So, we are treating uh, corruption, combating corruption in this uh, comprehensive way. Um, uh, Fight against corruption is conducted within the national strategy. National strategy, which means that all measures are organized, coordinated, okay? And the measures uh, are taken in certain areas. Uh, two crucial areas are prevention of corruption, right? Which is a rather broad topic, very broad topic, and it can grow and shrink, okay, depending on the position of the state. And I spoke to you about this in a, one of our previous lectures about the strategic planning of fight against corruption. Okay, and apart from the prevention of corruption, there is a narrower, um, narrower in comparison to prevention. 
This area is called incrimination or criminalization of corruption, okay? Although it's narrower than prevention of corruption, but it's certainly quite a wide topic. And today we're only covering part of it, okay? We are covering uh, only the part related to, to the um, um, criminalization of a public sector corruption. The corruption uh, patterns which are taking place in the public sector. So, um, that uh, in order, as a key to this, as an opening to this topic, I shall uh, repeat what I told you in the previous lectures, that there's no single definition of corruption, okay? Um, there's no single definition, and uh, there are certain approaches to try and define and conceptualize corruption, and some international organizations like Transparency International, World Bank, and other institutions, they took on some working uh, definition, but if, of course it doesn't cover all the elements of this broad concept of corruption. So instead, uh, the countries and legal communities, uh, the international legal community, uh, they adopted this approach whereby they are trying to um, develop some sort of a wide and inclusive interpretation of corruption, right? Which will uh, try and encompass all possible types of patterns and behaviors of behavior of um, uh, of uh, corruption. Um, in this regard, in this regard, um, I shall point out that um, the approach it uh, purports the adopting of the. Um, uh, specific terms which can be interpreted in a wider way okay and the uh, the list of uh, the list of actions and the list of objects of elements uh, it's formulated in a such a way that it's not exhaustive okay this this terminology is referring to concepts which are not um, exhaustive in in listing its elements in order not to allow criminals uh, to evade liability for uh, corrupt type behaviors, we know that um, as everything else, corruption and criminal behaviors, they're developing and they are uh, evolving. So new forms of corruption are emerging and therefore uh, the criminal legislation has to be at least in, in the, at the same pace as uh, the development of um, into this illegal type of behaviors. We covered the issues of the concepts of offer, uh, offer promise, acceptance and solicitation, uh, as well as acceptance of the offer and promise. These are the elements, uh, relatively new elements, uh, uh, specifically relevant to uh, crimes of bribery, trade and influence, and uh, uh, they actually are used to um, signify that uh, not only the actual acceptance or giving of undue advantage is considered a completed or accomplished uh, offense of bribery, but also these types of behavior with which were previously considered as like inquit uh, crimes. Now they are fully considered as accomplished offenses. We covered such a concept as third-party benefit, which uh, signifies that a uh, public official, usually a public official, is getting this undue advantage not only for himself, due to these sophisticated arrangements, the benefit may go to another third person or entity, uh, which can be uh, even a charitable organization, and it, it can look benign on the face of it, but in fact it can actually um, mask this illegal type of behavior and um, this means that there are certain different kinds of uh, arrangements to conceal the beneficial ownership of a property so modern definition of bribery this third party benefit it actually covers this uh, type of um, crimes this type of behaviors and consequences Next one is undue advantage. It's everything that puts uh, the perpetrator in a better posi position that he or she used to, to be before committing this corruption offense. 
As regards uh, property, we know that it's a quite wide range, wide range, and it can be anything. It can be tangible or intangible, corporate or incorporate. It can be uh, material, immaterial, and it can be expressed. It can have certain value that can be expressed in monetary terms, in currencies, or cannot be expressed in monetary uh, terms, okay? And it could be legal documents which express the title of people to certain property. We also covered in our previous uh, lectures, in a previous lectures specifically, the crimes of bribery and embezzlement uh, in public sector, uh, specifically the active and passive, tri uh, passive bribery. Uh, the incrimination of uh, corruption in public sector in uh, UNCAC you can see on your screen. You can consult a text of convention as well as legislative guide for the implementation of the convention, which is a good source of reading and understanding these issues. In national legislation, we uh, noted that um, corruption offences are mostly concentrated in Chapter 30 of the Penal Code, and you can see this uh, list of offences. Of course, uh, this list doesn't cover all the offences, all the corruption type offences that are reflected in our legislation. In our legislation, and by saying our legislation, I have to underline and stress one issue, which you certainly know, but it's worth repeating it, that in Azerbaijan, unlike some other countries where there can be multiple sources of um, uh, criminal law provisions, where different laws and statutes or other type of uh, legal instruments uh, can define uh, legal responsibility, legal liability. In Azerbaijan, it's different. We follow strictly the uh, tradition of continental law, uh, civil law system. So all the criminal legislation of Azerbaijan uh, is concentrated in the penal code. So unless it's reflected, the behavior is described in the specific part, in the specific uh, part of the penal code, it cannot be prosecuted and it will not be considered a crime. Uh, the uh, corruption offences are not only reflected in this chapter 30. As you can see above chapter, cha chapter 30, there's section 179 entitled embezzlement and diversion, which is a, a crime against property. And there are other types of uh, crimes which can be committed by public officials uh, more than 60 type of crimes, um, they are committed in different areas and I will speak to them in our uh, uh, subsequent lectures. But now in red color you can see the crimes which we have already covered, active and passive bribery and embezzlement. The key idea which we always have to bear in mind is reflected in Article 28 of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. I will read it out for you. Knowledge, intent or purpose required as an element of an offence established in accordance with this convention may be inferred from objective factual circumstances. In fact, this is a kind of provision which we have to kind of repeat to ourselves again and again because uh, while it appears rather easy and simple on its face it's a rather um, key and instrumental provision it's a rather sophisticated for implementation in practice it means that uh, all these elements which we have described earlier such as offer and promise and solicitation they uh, are very difficult in practice to be proved. They have to be proved through uh, objective circumstances, factual circumstances of the case. And this provision is key to the full application of these um, uh, new provisions, relatively new provisions of the penal code. So let us switch to the uh, specific crimes. Enough of revision. The first one on our list is the abuse of function, uh, which is reflected, which is provided for in the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. 
I will read it out for you as it is uh, laid down in the convention first. So it's a when committed intentionally, of course, the abuse of functions or position, that is the performance of or failure to perform an act in violation of laws by a public official in the discharge of his or her functions and for the purpose of obtaining an undue advantage for himself or herself or for another person or entity. Uh, don't be perplexed by this long uh, definition. I will read now the excerpt from the Penal Code of Azerbaijan, which as you can see is uh, rather similar to it, but slightly differs in accordance with the legal tradition of formulating legislation. The abuse of function uh, provided by Section 308 of the PC reads as follows, abusing official powers that is deliberate, contrary to interest of service, used by the official of service powers from self-interest or other personal interests, causing essential harm to rights and legitimate interests of citizens or organizations, or protected by law interests of a society or state. Well, I try to keep the text of the legislation as close as possible to the uh, actual text uh, in uh, Azerbaijani language uh, without using these fancy terms and losing the real meaning of it. Um, the convention uh, and its drafters and uh, many times they reiterated this position and it's also reflected in the legislative guide to the ANCAC that we shall not uh, be rather picky about the specific terms and we shall understand everything in context for the sake of international cooperation, good measure of legal cooperation between countries. So uh, in a sense, uh, not in a sense, but actually this provision uh, meets the requirements of the United Nations Convention and I'll try to show it to you by dissecting this uh, description, okay? So, PC Section 308, uh, entitled Abuse of uh, Functional Power, um, as you like. Um, the subjective element, mensuria, is intentional, of course, as all the corruption offences. This crime can be committed only in the state of mind that is pertinent to this type of guilt. All other types of guilt will not be accepted. Uh, and if not directly established the direct intent, then there would be no crime and no criminal prosecution. Um, actus reus, the objective element, um, objective um, uh, happening of the crime. The perpetrator here, of course, is a public official. I will tell in our next lectures that this crime can be perpetrated uh, also in private sector, but for the sake of this lecture of our today's topic, I'll just mention that the uh, perpetrator should be the public official. Behavior, uh, the behavior during this uh, crime is a performance or failure to perform an act. It's similar to the um, all different types of corruption offenses. Modus operandi as it is happening, as it's taking place in uh, in uh, real life, it's abuse of function, and it's abuse of abuse of function against the interest of the service. Okay, this this terminology is following the legal traditions. The incentive here, which um, which is provided for by the ANCAC, is undue advantage, i.e., everything which puts the perpetrator in a better position than he used to be prior to committing this uh, illegal act. While I say this, um, undue advantage, now it's in the position, uh, it's exactly formulated this way as undue advantage. Also, in, uh, in, when you look at our national legislation at the provision of provisions of section 308, you will see that it mentions that any advantage, including personal interest, 
I should tell that this formulation of the offense exists from long time ago and it was as closest as uh, domestic legislation of Azerbaijan could meet the requirement of criminalizing immaterial benefits. This term of a personal interest was used rather widely and it was, it was and it is widely interpreted in uh, the legal community uh, including investigators, uh, lawyers, uh, academicians, prosecutors and judges. So uh, even before our bribery provisions were brought in line with the United Nations Convention and Criminal Law Convention on Corruption provisions, and before they didn't have this uh, element of immaterial benefit, but abuse of office for a long time, it has this concept of um, undue advantage. The beneficiary uh, in this offence abusive function is the official uh, himself or herself or another person or entity and this could be anyone, okay? This could be anyone, this in practice if you look at the uh, cases, criminal cases uh, investigated, prosecuted and adjudicated in Azerbaijan, you could see that different types of um, uh, beneficiaries could be identified. Um, you can actually find these cases at the uh, website of the Supreme Court. If you go through and browse the cases, there are actual cases there, but in Azerbaijani language, unfortunately not available in English. So you can find out that uh, the benefit can go to uh, other uh, private persons or legal persons or other entities. And this element is covered fully in section 308. Condition, uh, necessary element in order to establish this crime. Uh, one of these elements is uh, discharging of his or her functions. So this act, this... Um, um, uh, this performance of, of act or uh, act or uh, failure to perform an act, it has to be linked to the discharge of uh, the functions of the public official. And another certainly a very important and uh, instrumental condition is violation of laws. Uh, it has to be illegal. And here I, as you see on the screen, um, I just introduce this new uh, provision to you. It's about consequence. The PC uh, section 308 uh, envisages is something uh, in addition to what is described in a relevant article of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. As a necessary condition, it establishes that in the as a result of this uh, criminal behavior of a public official, uh, there should be, there, it, there ought to be some in, uh, significant damage inflicted, okay? If we do not manage to uh, establish that the significant damage was uh, inflicted as a result of the commission of this crime, then there would be no offense, okay? According to the criminal procedure legislation of Azerbaijan, as you know, uh, all crimes are uh, um, composed of elements and links between these elements. And you saw the importance of casual links in our previous lectures. It's, it stands for all crimes, all corruption crimes. In addition to elements, you have to build and establish these links, causal links. Unless you manage to establish all links, uh, it will not be uh, possible to um, see it as a crime. So it will not be a crime in the eyes of the law and it will not be possible to prosecute a person for it. And when we say significant damage, usually it's a damage, it's a term which was established, um, uh, which allows for a subjective, uh, subjective position of uh, authorities which are applying this uh, legislative provision it allows to exclude this de minimis uh, type of uh, behavior 
where a, a small or no damage was inflicted. The law uh, uh, prescribes not to go after these uh, significant acts and it might look uncertain but in practice there's a great deal of the case law which specifically deals with this concept and significant damage is a damage which actually changes the legal position which um, um, leads to the emergence of some legal consequences for, for the affected parties and when I say affected parties, I mean the rights of physical persons, interests of uh, legal persons or protected statutory interests of uh, society or a state indeed. So this additional requirement is, uh, it only exists in domestic legislation and it doesn't exist in uh, the United Nations uh, Convention Against Corruption. So, from what I've just described to you, it looks like these two offences are rather similar. Okay, When I saw it for the first time, I couldn't help being just surprised how similar the abuse of function and bribery provision offences are. And among the similarities which can be identified, and I list only a few, uh, if you research, if you go into detail for a greater, deeper uh, review and research, you will find more similarities. But this uh, struck me as uh, rather uh, significant ones. Uh, first one is undue advantage. In both of these crimes, uh, it's all about, these both crimes are about, and they're both evolving around the undue advantage. Okay, It's a driving force that uh, instigate that move people to commit these crimes. Bribery, where the actual passive, and abuse of function. In both cases, abuse of function and bribery, public officials are involved. Uh, even in the case of active bribery, where the perpetrator is a person who is trying to offer undue advantage or promise or give it to him, uh, it's targeting public official. And in passive bribery, the perpetrator is a public official, and in abusive function, the perpetrator is public official too. Both these crimes, uh, bribery and abuse of function, they are committed through action or inaction. And uh, again, both of them are committed within the framework of the functions, of the function of public official, i.e. in discharge of his or her function. So what's the difference? I guess I was looking exactly the same puzzled way as this animation. What can be the difference? Um, if you are just listening to it, I will allow you some time, a couple of seconds to ponder on this issue unless it's absolutely clear for you in this case i think you're something a little less than genius uh, i wasn't that um i wasn't that understanding in the beginning when i first uh, dealt with these concepts so um the difference which can be identified and again this is not full exhaustive list you can go dip uh, if you have plenty of time, you're most welcome to conduct your own research and find out about the differences. The striking differences are, for the, in the first place, it's about um, illegal act. Well, uh, in bribery, as we know, the illegal acts are um, the subject matter of um, bribery only in the aggravated form. And I specifically emphasized this in our previous lecture that uh, giving or uh, accepting of undue advantage with all these different uh, forms of behavior, uh, they are targeting this um, illegal behavior of public official on behalf of the, on, 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 on the part of public official only in the aggravated forms of uh, bribery. While in the case of abuse of office or abuse of a function or power, it's always uh, about illegal behavior. It's not about correct behavior, it's not about lawful behavior, it's about 
uh, illegal behavior. One point which I actually missed when I introduced to you this offense is about the concept of illegal behavior. When we say illegal, it doesn't necessarily mean that any specific law or statutes provision must be broken. Not every type of regulation can be performed through laws. So it can be different type of uh, legal instruments and it can be all sorts of statutory instruments. It can be uh, normative and legal acts uh, at different levels below the statutes and laws. So uh, the public official, uh, the public official uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in this situation, he, he or she has to break some specific a legislative provision when we say uh, legislative uh, his uh, illegal uh, act anything which is reflected in his terms of office or his authorities the second distinction which I identify is uh, the giver of undue advantage um, while it's specific in case of bribery who is the giver of um, uh, of undue advantage it's not uh, quite always the case in, in uh, abuse of function or abuse of power. It's not clear whether the, um, there was someone identified, was identified as a, a person who is giving or offering or promising this undue advantage. If you go after public official in uh, a bribery case, uh, uh, with these charges of uh, bribery, you have to specifically demonstrate who is giving the undue advantage and it's not the case in the case of abuse of function. That brings me to the third point. Uh, the third point is about bargain. As I said to you uh, an instant earlier, uh, bribery in a sense it's a bargain. It's a bargain, it's a transaction, struck or not struck fully, uh, between two parties where you identify the, the two parties and it's about the demand and supply of the undue advantage whereas in the case of abuse of office uh, it is not always possible and it's certainly not necessary to to demonstrate it as a uh, to demonstrate it as a type of bargain where you have to identify two sides of it. And this brings me to the uh, ultimate uh, condition which uh, marks the difference between these two offenses. And it's uh, here I have to go into the criminal procedure, right? As you remember, and I hope that you do remember from your uh, studies for your undergraduate degrees in law faculty. Criminal cases can be launched uh, in Azerbaijan and in many other jurisdictions in two ways, in rem and in personam. First one is about the fact of a crime and the second one is about a person, a perpetrator. When you have sufficient uh, necessary uh, evidence, you are entitled to launch as an authority, as a criminal investigation or prosecution authority, you are entitled to uh, launch a criminal proceedings or investigation or criminal case, depends on how it's entitled in various jurisdictions. And uh, when it's about bribery, it has to be a person. It has to be a person who you go after uh, in order to launch, launch a criminal case or criminal proceedings uh, under the section of uh, uh, penal code on bribery. You cannot uh, start a criminal case uh, when you don't know exactly the parties to this bargain. So in many instances, uh, it happens quite uh, often in Azerbaijan and similar jurisdictions that uh, criminal cases are usually launched under section 308. Under 308, uh, because there is uh, apparently you can prove much easier the fact of a crime and not prove but demonstrate that there is a possibility of a crime having been committed. As an example, I can give you the situation when, for example, um, 
a national authority is uh, traveling in the country and all of a sudden they find out that in some region there's a building erected without due permission or no permission. In this case, uh, you can. it is apparent that this building was committed um, against the uh, requirements of the law because there's no uh, traces of of legal operation in constructing this building. So you have a clear fact of a uh, apparent fact of crime uh, having been committed, but you don't know yet who was involved in the commission of this crime. In that case, uh, the criminal case will probably uh, be launched under section 308 on abuse of function. It is, however, possible that in the course of the investigation, the investigator or prosecutor, he can actually, he or she can prove that uh, there was certainly some uh, bribery actions, bri bribery behavior, behavior um, involved in this, uh, in this instance. So they can collect and prove that undue advantage exchange hands between uh, parties to the bargain and in that case the criminal case will be uh, requalified and new charges of bribery will be brought but that shows the significant difference between um, these two type of offenses. I hope I uh, somehow clarified or shed a light on this issue because you won't find many materials available in, in, in the, the literature and it doesn't say a lot, uh, a lot deal in, about on this topic in the legislative guide on uh, on uh, United Nations Convention implementation. Let us look at where this crime is located in the classification of crimes. I told you in the previous lecture that it's really important. Um, it's really important how crime is uh, classific classified. There are four grades, as you know. Uh, in our legislation, um, four grades depending on their gravity, and although the primary um, uh, primary criterion for uh, discriminating between these um, these various types of offences, the main one uh, the the criterion is uh, the number of years of imprisonment for each uh, category of offences, and we are. Um, we uh, classify crimes according to grade one crimes of not big public danger, grade two less serious crimes, grade three serious crimes, and grade four especially serious crimes. And the threshold for the first category is up to two years, for less serious crimes is seven years, for serious crimes is 12 years, and or everything which is punished above 12 years of imprisonment or indeed life imprisonment is considered especially serious offences. As I told you until very recently, corruption offences, they floated uh, in this uh, category of less serious and serious crimes and I think 95% of offences are still there. Just legislator recently made amendments where some some crimes are in the fourth category and first category, but uh, they are not many. So let's look, um, before looking at where these ab different types of abuse of function are, um, I shall uh, remind you that the classification of crimes also have bearing upon the um, term of the... Um, statute of limitation. It also has certain bearings on the um, uh, term of the length of the criminal investigation and the length of the custody at the pretrial stage. So uh, PC section 308 abuse of function. The first category of um, basic, uh, basic, um, basic type of abuse of functions is where significant damage is inflicted and the significant damage uh, damage is the criterion which allows to differentiate between different forms of abuse of function. It is um, attributed to the category of less serious crimes up to seven years of punishment. 
I noted here ordinary offense, but uh, I mean, crimes are not ordinary. The uh, occurrence of a crime is not an ordinary event in life, of course. What I meant here, it's a basic type of um, abuse of office. Uh, the other um, the other category is um, uh, with uh, more grave. Uh, it's an aggravated form of uh, abuse of function. It's still in the category of less serious crimes, which it means that it's a, it's the sanction for this offense is uh, up to seven years. But I shall note to you that there's a difference between sanctions. They are not the same. You can check uh, the um, provisions of the penal code by looking in it. Okay. Um, in accordance with the requirements of the United Nations Convention that sanctions shall be um, proportionate, dissuasive and adequate, right? Uh, the uh, sanctions are graded according to the level of gravity. Um, for a basic type of abuse of office, it, it's less, it's not up to seven years, it's less than that. Um, while uh, for the uh, more grave form or the aggravated form, it's uh, up to seven years indeed. So the difference, as you see here in this, um, in this figure, it's uh, when as a result of the commission of abuse of function, um, the perpetrator inflicts grave consequences. It's still the same range of affected people and organizations, including society and state, but it's about grave consequences. Or if these acts are affecting in some way the results of a referendum, which is a type of a national vote on some issue which is taken uh, for the national voting, what is what is this grave consequence? Uh, significant damage, it sounds sufficient enough to cover all these serious instances of damage, but the grave consequences, um, it's not specified anywhere in the legislation of Azerbaijan what uh, the grave consequence is. Uh, it's, however, discussed a long, in length um, in the uh, discipline of criminal law, discipline as a discipline of study and the criteria which are accepted and you can see that in the decisions of the Supreme Court and some decisions of the plenary uh, board of the Supreme Court which have substantial bearing on the uh, which substantially affect the uh, case law in Azerbaijan um, you can see that the grave consequences are some consequences that are considered as um, devastating um, from the subjective point of view and that means that in a from subjective and objective point of view in subjective is uh, when it's um, grave in the eyes of the ordinary people ordinary member of society and this is uh, stipulated this is usually defined by the values of a society by the position of society at certain period of time uh, with time this co this uh, concept of great grave consequence it evolves as an example which i can give you from the case law uh, cases investigated by the specialized um, national anti-corruption agency in the field of detection investigation and prosecution of corruption offenses the anti-corruption directorate uh, a few years ago, there was a case in the, in the uh, end of uh, the 2000, year 2000s, uh, 2000 years, um, I think around 2008 or 9, um, when um, a person was apprehended uh, in his house, which he used as a production center for counterfeited uh, medication. And at that time, it was a big deal. It was a big deal, and there were big, uh, several causalities, uh, serious consequences, including fatalities uh, of uh, people who suffered as a result of this counterfeited uh, medication produced in, in country uh, or outside the country, uh, which were um, uh, brought into the country illegally. And this medication or this 
this counterfeited medication didn't meet the specification of the um, of the drugs which they were, were um, uh, which were described as and in that specific case uh, the uh, medication was some sort of injection which was displayed as an uh, injection uh, for the flu and um, fever of kids and in fact the content of this injection as was uh, it was found out during the investigation it didn't contain any hazardous things inside it but it didn't have any uh, any useful uh, elements too either uh, it was just some some ordinary uh, substance which can be intravenously administered to a kid but imagine at the difficult time when a person is uh, having when a kid has a fever and you expect that medication will uh, take it down it's just some ordinary uh, liquid which doesn't uh, help in any way so um, the investigation and prosecution took the stance that um, uh, this uh, by producing and selling this type of type of counterfeited medication the person was trying trying to commit he was attempting to commit a uh, offense uh, provided for by section 308.2 subsection 2 i.e causing grave consequences the grave form of abuse of function and the, uh, despite the um despite the arguments brought uh, forward by the defense side the court upheld uh, the position of the prosecution so now you have an impression of what uh, the grave consequences could be there are some clear-cut uh, instances of grave consequences as well such as infliction of uh, grave bodily harm or death of the affected person uh, now let us move to uh, trade and influence offense, which is uh, described in the United Nations Convention Against Corruption and in PC Section 312-1. Um, uh, here I, uh, in this slide I uh, show you the elements of the offenses which are prone to both active and passive trade and influence. I'll read it straight away, straight uh, to you. In order that, according to the ANCAC, in order that the public official or the person abuse his or her real or supposed influence with a view to obtaining from an administration or public authority of the state an undue advantage. Uh, these provisions are, uh, to a certain degree, are mirrored in national legislation with a provision that says um, with the purpose of exerting an improper influence over the decision making of an official using his or her real or assumed possibilities of influence again you have to take into account these uh, legal traditions of the state in expressing the same idea so let us dissect first the passive trade and influence offense as in all corruption offenses, it's about direct intent, it's intentional. When it comes to objective element of the offense, the perpetrator here could be anyone, anyone including public official. Um, incentive here again, as in other corruption offenses, it's undue advantage, i.e. everything which puts the perpetrator in a better position than he or she used to be before committing this illegal act, in this case, passive trade and influence. Um, beneficiary, who is beneficiary in this case? It's uh, this anyone person, uh, which can be also a uh, public official, anyone himself or herself, or indeed any other person or um, entity. The same as in the case of uh, bribery. Um, modus operandi, um, similar situation as to the um, bribery provisions. While the United Nations Convention require uh, criminalization of solicitation or acceptance. Um, uh, Azerbaijani legislation goes a bit further than that 
and it's in compliance with the Council of Europe's, uh, uh, with the European uh, Criminal Law Convention on Corruption. So it also um, it also criminalizes acceptance of uh, offer and promise, and this um, is uh, uh, these actions are criminalized uh, whether they are done directly or indirectly as you can see in order to cover all the intermediaries the what type of behavior it signifies this offense it describes the behavior when uh, that person that uh, mysterious any one person uh, who can be a public official as well and i shall note that most probably it would be public official because people um people they tend to believe the the someone with official powers when they try to kind of sort off their problems so um this uh, anyone who can potentially be a public official he abuses his or her influence that he can deal with some issue which are of interest to the outside to the people who are dealing with this mysterious perpetrator okay but um, he's not mysterious of course it's a person who is committing a crime and here we speak about a real or supposed influence the influence which uh, is apparent uh, which can be uh, manifested which can be displayed uh, in the form of uh, friendly ties or relation ties or it cannot it can be supposed due to for example affiliation in the same uh, political party or in the same golf club it can be uh, supposed but sometimes uh, quite often it is not possible to establish in a clear matter and meeting the criteria of the criminal evidence so um, it is about the supposed um, something that can be supposed here the the level of uh, of the degree of this um, connection is a bit lowered by using this term and the purpose is to obtain uh, undue advantage uh, from administration or public authority so as you can see here the range is rather wide okay the administration or public authority can be anything it can be public official or enterprise or state institution but in order uh, to make it difficult easier for you to understand this um, crime one point which you also need to take into account that no consequences of the action has to be established uh, unlike uh, the previous offense as you saw uh, abuse of function in Azerbaijan you have to establish this um, uh, this uh, damage sufficient damage uh, or grave damage as a result of the behavior so I draw this nice uh, little scheme uh, which will help you to understand I hope this crime in this small uh, boxes which you can see these are people these are usually people because any the crimes are committed um, uh, by this type of people and these are participants to the event while the uh, people who are directly involved in the of, of offense uh, of these two uh, this is a perpetrator which could be public official or anyone he solicits uh, accepts or accepts of a promise of undue advantage from anyone and this is wide public right this is not an open market but this is a criminal dealing so someone is uh, he's uh, soliciting or accepting it in order this casual leaks as I told you which need need to be established one is that he solicit and accepts um, and then do advantage and the second one is that he's influencing the authority any authority that I described to you with the purpose of extracting undue advantage and it's not important who this undue advantage is actually going to. Uh, we will see that this issue is rather important in the case of active trade and influence, but here it's not really, it doesn't really matter it, it goes to. It has to go to someone, definitely, but investigation and prosecution 
doesn't need to establish, but they just need to establish that the purpose of exerting of influence was to extract the undue advantage. It can go to in all sides, okay? Uh, as I told you, uh, apart from elements, it's crucial to establish all these casual links. Now we're switching to active trading influence. And here again, uh, Mansuria is direct intent, as in all corruption offenses. Um, objective element, perpetrator, can be anyone. It can, uh, there is a remote possibility that it can be public official, but most likely not. It can be anyone uh, who is operating with the incentive of undue advantage, i.e. everything that puts the perpetrator in a better position than, than he used to be, used to have uh, prior to the commission of the illegal act, in this case, active trading influence. Uh, beneficiary is that person who is uh, actually offering, promising or giving a due advantage. So beneficiary is that person um, is offering or promising, as you see, modus operandi uh, or giving directly or indirectly to cover all the intermediaries, is offering undue advantage um, to, a, to some other person who can be, uh, to anyone who can be also public official, most likely, this undue advantage will be offered to a public official in order that this person, the payee, who receives this, uh, receives or offered or promised this undue advantage, that he abuse his or her influence, real or supposed. I'm not going to repeat these same provisions. You just uh, need to, uh, you can use the same knowledge in uh, respect of this type of behavior as in passive trading influence. The purpose here is to obtain a due advantage uh, from an administration or public authority. But here comes the important uh, element, which is for the investigate, for the instigator, okay, for this uh, perpetrator. The undue advantage is um, actually going to the perpetrator, right? We, know, we have to specifically establish that this guy is offering, promising and giving undue advantage in order to get this undue advantage, the new undue advantage, uh, like he's offering money to get, a, uh, to get someone to influence someone in the authority to give, issue him a license, okay, for himself. And none of the consequences needs to be established here again. Nice, uh, nice uh, scheme to explain you it how it happens in real life. Um, as you see, two sides involved in this illegal um, illegal um, uh, behavior perpetrator or uh, here who is offering, promising and giving undue advantage to this person who is anyone and potentially a public official in order that this person here, he actually influences the authority through his real or uh, supposed uh, possibilities of influence um, so, that, so that this authority actually uh, produce some undue advantage for the benefit of perpetrators. So we have this vicious circle, okay, this nasty criminal vicious circle where this guy is giving something in order to get something. Um, so this this scheme, well, I hope it will help you to understand this, um, this offense. So what's this? There are certainly similarities, similarities, unless uh, unless you're absolutely smart, and I hope you are, and you understood this, in which case next couple of minutes will not be necessary for you. But if you didn't understand it, uh, uh, the difference, I'll go over this bit. There are certainly similarities such as undue advantage, uh, public official and action and inaction elements. 
in this uh, between these two types of offenses, public officials. I wrote this here, but uh, it's most likely than not. Okay, in case of trade of influence, most likely than not, uh, public official will be involved. While in bribery cases, public official will be involved in all uh, in all uh, scenarios. Well, what's the difference then? Uh, what's the difference then? Uh, again, our friend is here asking this important question and inspiring me to answer it to you. Uh, the difference is about receiver of undue advantage. Not necessarily it's a public official in the case of trade and influence, and it's always a public official in bribery case of course except that case when uh, the perpetrator this nasty perpetrator uh, he uh, offers uh, the uh, undue advantage to public official and he doesn't want to receive it uh, he doesn't promise but he offers it uh, receiver on the receiving side of both offenses um, not always it's a public official in the trade of in influence cases and it's always public official in bribery cases it's about jurisdiction it's about jurisdiction uh, when um, the person in uh, the case of bribery he is taking this taking or uh, soliciting or accepting this offer and promise often due advantage within the framework of his duties while in the case of trade and influence, it's about, uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily connect it. It's not connected to his functions, right? It's absolutely, uh, actually, it's outside of his functions. He's not dealing with this sort of issues for which he's getting this undue influence, uh, undue advantage. Um, um, before we go to this classification of crimes, I want to draw your attention to one very specific and important issue, uh, which is actually appearing in practice more than in theory. And well, of course, it's reflected in theory as well. Sometimes a prosecution can go after um, after a case after a case, which can otherwise be uh, prosecuted and investigated as a bribery when it involves intermediaries, uh, when it can establish all these links, okay, between the payer of a bribe and here it's official who is taking bribe, okay, and there is an intermediary here. Sometimes it's possible that in practice, in practice, the investigation can prove the link between these two, between the payer of a bribe and intermediary, but he cannot establish a link that undue advantage further went to the public official. In that case, the investigator and prosecutor will go uh, under this section of trading influence rather than bribery, because unless he manages to, to, to prove the flow of undue advantage from perpetrator to public official via intermediary, and unless he can establish all these elements in the mosaic uh, he will go he will have to go under the uh, offense of trade and influence and not bribery um, let us see um, how uh, where this um, where this offense is in the classification of crimes which are four in total and I'm not repeating this again you see it's on your screen um, active and passive bribe, uh, trade and influence are both in the same section and they are both uh, less serious crimes uh, with sanction up to seven years. Of course, um, sanction for the active trade and influence is lesser than, um, than for passive trade and influence, not uh, a great deal lesser. It's uh, lesser in some, uh, some small degree, but it's still lesser than that. Uh, but as you can see, legislator treats this offense in a serious manner. So that brings me to the end of our today's lecture. I repeat again uh, my slogans, our slogans, I hope. Uh, stay at home during these difficult times. 
be optimistic. It will end, I hope, soon, this difficult situation. And most importantly, don't waste your time and continue listening to my lectures. <laughs>